So today we have uh, Jonathan London, who's going to be talking to us about uh, this is why users cannot understand your content. Um, and with that, I think it's time for me to hand over to Jonathan. Thanks. Thanks for having me here. So my name is Jonathan London. And I will be today talking about why users cannot understand your content. But before I introduce myself and the agenda, I would just like to make a short experiment to get a feeling what I will be talking about. So imagine yourself being a user that you're using a software appliance or device and you are trying to do accomplish something and you're getting stuck. And you turn out for the user manual to find out how to accomplish the task. So you find a piece of content. But please read this and see if you can understand. Well, we've had one okay. person just say no. <laughs> so any ideas of what this, what, what kind of procedure are we talking about here? Any ideas? Yeah. <laughs> General comments just saying awful, uh, unclear, clear as mud. Um, but yeah, something maybe about sorting laundry, some kind of sorting. Um, and yeah. some, some advice there as well about separating context from steps. So people with ideas of what to do next. Yeah, exactly. So of course we are technical communicators, so let us ideas. This sample is coming from a handbook of reading comprehension and it's of course made deliberately to be impossible to understand, but it sort of exaggerates the kind of a situation where users might end up. You don't understand anything. This is completely uh, garbage. Uh, which then leaves users frustrated and they can still not accomplish their task. And of course, we don't want users to end up like this. But what happens if we take this exact same text? This is the exact same text. And then we add a title and an image. So what happens then? Okay, so you don't have to read the whole thing. But hopefully here, this might be a little bit more understandable. So yeah. what actually happened here? Sorry, go for it. What is the, what is the uh, difference when we added the title and the image? The thing here is that the title and the image hopefully allowed you to shape a mental model. Since I assume that you all have uh, knowledge about washing clothes. So this is what I've been talking about. So understanding means shaping a mental model. And this is kind of a tricky thing. So the mental model allowed you to get a feeling of understanding to make sense. So you, you might sort of feel that, okay, what procedure is, groups, these kind of abstract and vague words. Uh, so today I will actually, uh, tell you, and I will hopefully you will learn what a mental model is, because that's very central to us as technical communicators. And I will also depict four sort of reasons, situations where users cannot shape a mental model. So here, when I'm saying shaping a mental model means to understand, and I will be focusing on text content. And at the end, I will share some insights on uh, how we can support users then to shape the relevant mental model. So uh, my name is Jonathan Landin, and I'm a technical communicator just like you. So I worked as a communicator all my life. And I work currently for a company called Exposoft as an information architect. So I work a lot with XML-based content management. So that is what I do uh, today mostly, organizing, classifying, and structuring technical documentation. So I have a background in the development of the 
data standard for those who are into XML based content management. But I'm especially interested in user behavior. So during my PhD studies, I did study users searching and reading behaviors and how we could design technical communication to support those behaviors. So what I will be talking about today, I will share some of the knowledge and insights that I've gained throughout this research, which is kind of interesting. I work for a company called Exposoft, and we have a component content management system. Yeah, this is some of the companies that are using this uh, our software to manage and translate and publish version handler technical documentation. So we help these companies uh, working with their XML based content management. But okay, let's get back to this core concept of a mental model, meaning to understand. So what is it? Well, let us take an, another example. So here we have a person who is reading a piece of text in a, it could be a web knowledge base about how an air filter on a machine works. So there's words, of course, and there's yeah, icons and symbols. To understand what you read, you need to be able to have domain knowledge. So this person, in this case, is lucky since the person has knowledge about air and machines, filters and how the things work. And the text that the person is reading allows, uh, in this case, it's a, it's a he, she, to connect to this knowledge to shape the mental model. So mental model is a cognitive phenomena that lives in the working memory. It's dynamic and it changes as the user is, uh, is actually reading more and more content. If the user starts to do something else, then the person would shape another mental model. And here's the thing that, from my perspective, humans don't shape mental models 24 seven. So it happens when we enter an unfamiliar situation where we feel we are not understand. We need to explain what it is that we see or we read. So mental models, it's kind of a mental representation of what it is that we uh, interact and what we see. So from the mental model, we can then uh, base our actions. You can plan what actions and steps and procedures to do. You can also use the mental model to avoid, avoid ending up and in, in avoid dangers. Okay, so, so they're very handy. And mental models can be called mental representations and well, the different names. Uh, but I will stick to mental model in this presentation. So once in this case, the reader is able to shape a mental model that makes sense. And then they maybe is doing an action, they can also internalize. So there's a process of learning that the shaped mental model turns into knowledge in the long term memory. This process of internalization and assimilation and accommodation. So this knowledge can then be activated later on when the user is interacting with some other things or reading something else. So this is how we learn in life. So this kind of cycle of reading, shaping a mental model, internalizing. Uh, so this is my point of view of how things work. This is very central for us as technical communicators because we want to make our users successful. So the main purpose of technical communication, I would say, is to support users to shape a relevant mental model. Because there's a learning happening here. When a user is going from a situation where they cannot accomplish a task to a situation where they can, they have learned. And to learn, you need to shape a mental model to then base your actions. But this kind of thing is kind of abstract. L let us look into a number of cases uh, when there is difficulties for users to understand, meaning to shape a mental model. So I have four reasons. And I will ask you again to read, see if you can figure out uh, the different sample text that I will show you. But the first reason is actually relating back to this washing clothes text. So let's look at the audience for that particular piece of content. If that was you who participated in this presentation, uh, I don't know you that well, but I would assume that your domain knowledge about washing clothes is excellent, and your knowledge about the language of washing clothes is also excellent. But if the information design, which the first sample text that you read, had abstract and vague words like procedure, 
facility, materials that can signify a lot of things in the real world. Uh, there's, there was no clues on what type of domain knowledge to activate. We couldn't shape a mental model and that text become unreadable. So it's just kind of garbage. So, of course, and this is things we know as technical communicators. We should avoid using abstract and vague words. Uh, at least give users a clue of what kind of domain knowledge to relate to, or connect to, or activate. Okay, let's look at the reason number two. So again, from reading this text, any clues what this could be about? And I will actually ask James if, if you can pick out, if you have any, <laughs> feel free to pick out. Ah, so it's initial, yeah, initially nobody, nobody was, was responding. And now a few people I think have cottoned onto pigskin and gone with football. So there's football, <laughs> football and football broke a window. So yes. I think some people have translated, or at least that's what I would <laughs> ah, yeah, maybe. say. <laughs> of course, now the audience is native English speakers, so this would hopefully be no problem. But if I were to replace three words, so gal is girl, football, pigskin is football, casement is window. Then this, the second uh, example here might make more sense. So if we close our eyes, we can see maybe we are at the grandmother's house this summer, we are playing football in the yard or kind of reactivating domain knowledge about football and our experience about football. We can shape a mental model and it allows us to understand. But of course, the first case when we had gal and pigskin encasement. So if we have non-native English speaker audience, uh, where the knowledge about language is kind of poor. So we have an audience where they know about football, but they're not native English speakers. So their knowledge about pigskin is kind of poor. And the information design includes unusual words like casement and pig, pigskin. Yeah, of course, that would mean that users cannot uh, connect to their knowledge, cannot shape a mental model. There's no understanding. And in some sense, we know about this as technical communicators. Know your audience. What kind of knowledge do they have about the domain and about the language of the domain? So this is, of course, very central to uh, knowing your audience. So these two first samples might be kind of straightforward. Yeah, we know about this. But let's look at the third example. So again, I try to read these two or, or read these two sentences. And then the question here is, why did the, this case is a man, why did he decide not to cross the desert? What was the reason? And here I need to pronounce it correctly because I, at some presentation, I pronounced it desert and then it becomes something else. <laughs> Any clues of why? One one person's just written pudding question mark, <laughs> uh, but no, you're you're right. I'm uh, I'm reading that as desert uh, <laughs> rather than dessert. So I think pudding is not the answer here. Uh, oh, this again comes from uh, handbook of reading comprehension. Is is uh, and I modified a little bit. But what happens if we re replace one word? Actually, we replace the last word in bold here. So if we read the second text, the question, why did this man decide not to cross the lake? Does it make any more sense? Yeah, immediately you're getting responses about it makes sense. And in fact, somebody had previously said, um, now if the desert was actually a pond, so they preempted that, that potential replacement. Um, so yes, yeah. uh, gen general agreement, general agreement yeah. uh, and interesting factoids as well. <laughs> so what this, this example shows us is that knowledge about the domain is very central to understand, to be able to shape a mental model. Uh, because in the second example, 
we activated our knowledge about winter, about how ice and, and water behaves when, when we have minus degrees, etc. That heavy objects will break thin ice and you don't want to fall into cold water, that is unpleasant, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Nothing of that is stated in text. That is something we infer and assume from activating the domain knowledge. So we make inferences of how these sentences are bridged and how they relate together. Again, nothing of that is stated in the text. In the first example, if you knew about that in northern parts of Sweden, there is actually deserts. And they are during, they are kind of ponds in the desert and during the winter they get icy. So if you knew about that particular domain in northern parts of Sweden, then the first example would make perfectly sense. So the, the thing here is then that if user's domain knowledge is poor, you don't know about Swedish, asserts about how, how they would behave. Uh, but your knowledge about the language is excellent. There was no unusual or kind of strange abstract words. But the information design in this case didn't bridge the sentences. The, the designer assumed that the reader were aware of the Swedish deserts. Uh, but in this case, the audience didn't have that knowledge. And the result is that the reader cannot understand and that's the first example but when we replaced the desert of the lake then it becomes more understandable because we have general knowledge about winter in general uh, so this also tells us that it's again know your audience and know what kind of domain knowledge they do have and uh, so don't assume things that they actually uh, no knowledge that they do not have i will get back to sort of suggestion how can we design to these type of scenarios. But let's look at the fourth example, which is the kind of interesting. So again, you can read. Okay, so let's uh, hide it. And the question is, how big was the stone? There was a stone involved. There was a mentioning of, so was it small or was it big? So uh, immediately um, people are saying that it must've been small or small for the builder. Um, given it had to fit in the pocket. Uh, so that seems to be the consensus. There's a couple of people who quickly came up with sort of like a, a solution to the riddle, as I'm, I'm thinking of it now. Uh, so ways they can try and work out how to make it make sense. Uh, I'll be interested to see whether or not they're right, because they're thinking about things like model houses. Yeah, okay, that's, yeah, that's interesting. Well, if we look at the, there's a contradiction here, of course. The, a stone in, in in some sense had to be really big to smash a cottage that's our, our knowledge about the world tells us but if the owner put in the stone in his pocket he had to be really a giant but then the house had to be even bigger so this kind of doesn't make this doesn't make any sense there's a contradiction what research tells us that if there's a contradiction to uh, in the text to what the users knowledge that they have activated about how the world functions if I would ask you one week later, the thing in bold here, you would probably have ignored and say, no, there was no, he didn't put anything in his pocket. So things that contradicts means that the reader would reject, ignore, or reinterpret, because this, this contradiction doesn't fit into the domain knowledge about how the world functions. And this is also very central to us as technical communicators, when users the knowledge that you activate and what you are designing ends up in a contradiction. Let's look at another example. So again, I'll ask you to read, uh, this is a short text, so kind of read it quickly. So just putting it really quickly, so we don't pay a lot of time of skimming text. So here the question is, there was a person involved here what kind of occupation or role or job did that person have? Uh, 
You see, we have we have a quick witted, intelligent audience today. They're on it. <laughs> They started it straight away. Oh, okay, I couldn't fool you. Okay, sorry. <laughs> uh, so, so, so the eagle-eyed spotted uh, composter, um, uh, but uh, we did also have some people sort of saying, are they, are they actually a performer or a music player, uh, given the context? So, um, yeah, interesting. Was it a typo instead? Yeah, it could be a typo, but composter is actually the case here. Uh, so the the text the word in bold here. A composter can, of course, be a musician who plays music. But the thing here is that I showed you the image of the concert hall and the piano before you read the text. And then what research tells us is uh, you would activate domain knowledge about concert halls, pianos, there's musicians, someone is playing, you're an audience, and all of these kind of sometimes referred to as a schema. So that's, uh, and then when you saw the text, uh, now you are aware of that there is a contradiction and you're on your toes, but the general reader would try to fit this text into their already activated knowledge. And they would read composer. And then having asked them one week later, they say, yeah, it was a composer, not a composter. No, 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 no. So again, there is a contradiction to the knowledge that the user has activated and the text. And this is for technical communication, this is relevant because most of our users or a common scenario is that the user tries, tries to use the software, the machine or the device, ends up getting stuck, then turns to searching and finding something in your chatbot or web knowledge base or PDF. And they have already activated a lot of domain knowledge. Then they come to the reading. And if there's a contradiction, they will read and misinterpret what they read. And then they are still stuck and they can't get forward. And then they blame the manual. Now oh, that technical communicator is worthless. He couldn't write any content. So who is to blame here? I'm not sure. So the fourth example is kind of a little bit more tricky. Which way if we have the audience, their knowledge about the domain is excellent and their knowledge about language is excellent. But the information design includes this contradiction to sort of knowledge about how the world functions. Uh, this would mean that we would, we would still be able to shape a mental model, but that would be not relevant, not in accordance to the design of the software or the device. If users reject or ignore things that they read. So let's, let's look at the last kind of uh, last example. So imagine yourself being working on a fishing boat and your task is to clean the fish. You're thinking that, well, I don't want to do this anymore. This is, uh, I need to find a better way to clean the fish. And you know that there is kind of an appliance on board here that could be used to wash the fish. So you say, yeah, yeah, let's use it. So you grab the manual, find a page, and you start to read. And you say, oh, but yeah, yeah, th this tells me that I have to put the fish into the machine. Well, it's, it's said here. I have to group the fish. That kind of is awkward. But then I just toss it into the machine and then set it up, start to work, and it doesn't work. The machine, <laughs> it breaks. So what happened here? This is kind of a scenario of users that their knowledge about the world is misconceptual. They think that the washing machine can be used to wash fish, which is not how the, how the world or the design of the device works. And then they find a manual and they do a misconceptual reading and get stuck. And then they say, oh, it's the, it's the manual. It was really crappy. And the guy designing that manual, whoever that was, must be really crappy as well. Hmm. Yeah, I'm not so sure. So what does this kind of situation, what does it mean for a user who's trying to search and read something they find? So let's look at a couple of scenarios. And this is for novice users trying to, they're getting stuck. Their domain knowledge is perhaps poor and their knowledge about language of the domain is also poor. So we have Eric here, he is using a software and he's getting stuck. He's trying to upload a file in a software. So he's looking for the instruction. So he finds an instruction on how to download a file. So finding things is not difficult. Just Google or open a book. The difficult thing is to judge whether, whether the thing that you find is relevant to the task you're doing and your information need. That is the sort of challenge for, 
for the one searching and reading. If this, this instruction for downloading a file contains abstract words and, and unusual words, uh, Eric cannot shape a mental model, he cannot understand, and he says, well, I don't get it. He skips it, starts to turn to the other page. Maybe then he understands this as, ah, but this is about downloading a file. And I was looking for uploading a file. So, well, this is not relevant. He just says that, I ah, skip it. Maybe he does this misconceptual reading. So he, he thinks that it's actually about uploading a file. So he reads composer when it says composter. So then when he's trying, he's basing his action on the mental model that he shaped and he fails because yeah, he's actually downloading a file, not uploading. Let's say that he would find the content of the instruction on how to upload a file. And again, he tries to read it to judge if this is relevant for what he's doing. And it contains unusual words. He cannot shape a mental model. Ah, he cannot do it. Let's say that he does, again, a misconceptual reading. So he said, ah, but this, this is about downloading a file. And I was looking for uploading a file. So he, he is reading, again, uh, maybe he, the text was similar to the cottage and the stone or, or composter. So he says, well, this is not for me, and he skips it. Maybe he, he can sort of shape some mental model in some sense that's not really complete in a sense, but he says, yeah, this is, this is about uploading a file. But in step number three, he does a misconceptual reading. He's reading composer when it says composter. Well, then he's trying to do the task, he will fail. Ah, but okay, let's say that he really do understand and he can, his mental model is relevant and corresponds to uploading a file. And he starts to follow the procedures, everything is fine. And then he, he, he's, he's getting stuck again. What, how can this happen? Well, maybe his work task goal, actually what he's trying to do is to create a new file. So in this case, his information need and what he thinks he needs is misconceptual. He's looking for something that doesn't fit to what he's doing. It could be that it's not possible to upload anything in, in this software. So this is kind of that your domain knowledge can really end up in getting users to be uh, kind of complex to find and understand what you find. So what can we do about this then? How can we support users? And this is kind of the craftsmanship of, of being an information designer and working with technical communication. Uh, so we have to look at these four reasons. Uh, in the first case, when we design, we need, of course, to know our audience. What kind of knowledge do we have about the domain, about the device, software, or product that we are documenting? And what how their knowledge about the language of the domain? We need to of course, understand the audience. So avoid using abstract and vague words that can signify many, many things in the real world. But also to use visuals and use text. Titles is very important because titles and visuals could allow users to know what kind of domain knowledge to connect to and activate uh, to be able to shape a relevant mental model. And <clears throat> in the case that we have the, the sample with the pigskin and the gal, if you're writing for a non-English speaking audience and you're not translating, then of course, avoid using words that are not familiar. So use words that the audience are familiar with. Or if you need to use company specific function names or acronyms, then define what they mean. So supply a terminology or a definition list. And here, of course, we have the initiatives of plain language and, and simplify the English and all these things is very, uh, very important. In the case of a user who has poor knowledge about the domain, like a novice user, perhaps a beginner user. Uh, so don't assume that then the users have knowledge which they uh, evidently are lacking. So we could bridge sentences, for instance, in the, in the case of the uh, the lake and the heavy man, you could actually inform the user that in Sweden there are deserts and they, there are ponds and that during the winter they get icy, etc. So supply the knowledge that they are missing or provide links to them. And also be explicit and inform the audience of what knowledge 
you assume that they have. I think this is something that we do as technical communicators that in the introduction parts in the manual you can state that this manual is based on assuming that you know this and this and this and provide also the links to where to learn that knowledge if user might not have that domain knowledge. Uh, in the fourth example, we can actually use, I think it's called refutational text principle to make users aware and highlight that there might be a contradiction. So for instance, in the, the composter kind of example, uh, we can highlight having a, a note alert or a tip or could even be a warning saying, hey, dear user, be observed that here we're talking about a composter, not a composer. So that's some research shows that highlighting and making user aware of that there is a contradiction would probably mitigate them from doing misconceptual reading. So refutation on this case is kind of a powerful tool, but it's also, my experience, kind of difficult to know when to refute and not. Uh, but again, it comes down to knowing our audience and what they know and what kind of knowledge about the world they have. Uh, okay. So again, this is, of course, the way that we design, and this is mainly focusing on text content. So there are other approaches how we can design technical communication to support users in shaping a mental model. So besides text, we can use visuals and audiovisual content like a YouTube video, which is also uh, uses also shaping a mental model from reading those things. Uh, one interesting design approach is minimalism. And I assume that you are familiar with the design approach of minimalism or minimalist instruction, you know, John Carroll and IBM, and, which is, uh, uh, and from what I have learned about minimalism is that that is a design approach encouraging the user to shape a mental model from discovering and exploring, in that case it was a software, and not from reading. So minimalism in this case is not referring to minimizing the amount of words of cutting pages. So that I think that's a misconception, at least from the original thoughts. So minimal, minimalism comes from the idea that technical documentation should minimize the obstructiveness on users learning path, meaning to be as little as possible in the way of users getting out, doing real tasks, shape a mental model from exploring and discovering the tool. So minimalist instruction should uh, quickly get the user into trying out things and helping them to get back on track, to recognize an error and how, know how to recover from an error. Uh, and that's also why minimalist instruction needs to be, not to be complete because the user has to construct their own knowledge from making assumptions and inferences. That's also why minimalism means not to start with a lot of conceptual descriptions and introductions. So get the users to, explore and discover the tool right away. What I'll be looking into my research is reading with your hands. So when we read text and images and visuals and audiovisual content, we use our ears and eyes, of course. Uh, but we can also use our hands to read, to shape a mental model from using our hands and moving our hands. So what I've been looking into is uh, supplying the user with the puzzle, actually. So the user is in a learning activity here called a mediating activity. They are getting a number of tangible tokens, like symbols, like a puzzle basically, to signify different things in the, in the tool. And then they also get a guidance on how to assemble these tangible tokens into a result model. So when the user is self-regulating, moving things and change the mind, what they're actually doing is that they are shaping a mental model while they're assembling this, uh, these tokens into a model. So the result, what you see here is actually is kind of a visual or tangible representation of their mental model. So this could be particularly useful for beginner users, novice users who, uh, so not to force them to find content from searching and reading. Because we saw that that's, that's could be a complex thing, difficult, but there's a lot of sort of challenges in doing that. So this is some of the sort of examples of uh, the Scribenta house from people who have 
assembled uh, during a learning exercise when learning our component content management system Scribenta to get a big picture of how central things fits together in that case. Uh, so this is kind of a design approach which, which could be, I don't know, it could be useful, uh, especially for novice users. So that is what I intended to, that is the presentation. So I guess we have some time left for questions. Excellent, thank you very much. And I'd just like to tell everybody about a couple of things. Uh, so we have our podcast, uh, the latest edition uh, featuring Rahel Bailey talking about content strategy and her career and, and her, her involvement with the ISTC. Uh, it's a 30 minute podcast, well worth checking out and the link there istctechcom.podbean.com. Uh, and the other news is to let you know that ISTC Meets is taking a summer break. Uh, so uh, for the next few months, uh, we're not, um, we don't have any events planned, uh, but we do, uh, we are planning some stuff for the autumn. We've got um, some stuff we're planning starting in September. So to make sure that you uh, don't forget or lose track, uh, I'm encouraging you to, to jump onto Eventbrite and to make sure you're following ISTC on Eventbrite. Uh, and rather than give you the very complicated Eventbrite link, I would suggest you go to our website, istc.org.uk. Um, on the menu, you can browse to events and then ISTC meets or um, the URL on the screen there, slash event slash ISTC hyphen meets. Uh, and on there, there's a link over to our Eventbrite page and information about all the others. And um, there's also um, recordings of uh, previous talks, and this one will be made available there um, at a later date.